it's very hard to really strive to understand what journey you want to be on and why. Spending time thinking through that can be very, very rewarding. Figure out what that means to you and start as soon as possible, because if you actually are able to pull it off, it could be quite phenomenal. Welcome to How I Built My Small Business. I'm Ann McGinty, your host, and today we have Dr. Herschel Chokwala chatting with us about starting a biotech company. Herschel is the CEO and co-founder of Zymachem, which he founded in 2015 and recently celebrated a major milestone by closing a Series A funding in January this year. As a speaker at the SynBio Beta Conference in San Francisco and the Rethinking Materials Conference in London, he is passionate about bringing sustainability to everyday materials and reducing humanity's dependency on plastic. After hearing that microplastics can be carried through the placenta from mother to baby, Herschel doubled down on his mission to bring breakthrough technology products to everyday materials. Zymachem recently introduced BASE, B-A-Y-S-E, a biodegradable, bio-based, super-absorbent polymer that can be used to make diapers, the third largest item in landfills. He aims not only to tackle the hygiene industry, but coatings, textiles, and plastics. Zymachem has partnered with well-known brands, including Lululemon and Toyota. You can find a link through to his company in the episode's description. Before we jump into the interview, there is one thing that you can do to help me grow the show, and that is to please hit the follow button on your favorite streaming platform. Thank you so much. Let's get started. Thank you to our listeners for joining us today. Herschel, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So going back to 2014, what inspired you to originally start a biotech company? So just a little bit of background on sort of how I ended up starting the company. So I was born and raised in India. And as I was growing up, everyone in my family was a small business owner. Everyone. Aunts, uncles, father, grandfather, generations. We were making everywhere from copper wires to manufacturing textile garments. We had a lot of different businesses. And so the entrepreneurial way of thinking was quite ingrained with me from day one of my life. But as I was growing up and studying, I really fell in love with organic chemistry, which is what I would say is my first true love. And for those listeners who don't know what organic chemistry is, or maybe you don't know what organic chemistry is, I think we've all experienced that in some shape and form. It forms the basis of every material goods that we use today from paints on the walls to carpets on the floors to the plastic in the cars, like all of this is made with organic chemistry. And so I was very fascinated by that when I was growing up and I decided to do my PhD, which was very different from anybody else who had been in my family. And so as I started doing my PhD, I realized that enzymes and microbes do really the same type of chemistries that chemists have done over the past decades, but they do it with a lot of precision and under ambient conditions. So like room temperature in water, et cetera. All of this is to say that enzymes are the best catalyst or chemists out there that are a lot more efficient. It's a lot more sustainable. And it absolutely opens a completely new way of doing chemistry, which did not exist, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And so I realized as I was doing my PhD that this is still a quite nascent field, but it had a potential for massive impact. You know, the way chemistry, when it was invented to bring manufacturing to everyday goods in 1900s, think about DuPont's nylon as an example, right, used in stockings, all of those was invented in the early 1900s. Biology and enzymes and microbes have the opportunity to have the same impact, right? And so the first 10 years of my PhD plus post PhD life was spent at Davis and Berkeley, really learning from the best in the trade in academia. And the second half of my career over here was spent at Zymochem, which really sort of brought me back to my entrepreneurial roots and married the two things that I loved chemistry and enzymes. 
And so if you look at the name Zymochem, the, the Zyme comes from enzymes and the Ochem comes from organic chemistry. So it's really doing enzymes, doing organic chemistry to help us make the physical world in a more sustainable way. So how did you come up with the idea for your business, Zymochem? You know, the type of products in the industry that we are in, it's chemicals manufacturing, right? So these are physical goods that all of us use every day. So these are very, very large industries. And when you think about bringing a fundamental change to these very large industries, what I realized early on is that these new technologies need the ability to scale to very large degrees, right? This needs to be a scalable technology, a scalable business. And you need to be able to meet to consumers at a price point where they exist today, right? So if you want to make change at massive scales, those are sort of two prerequisites to what you need to do. And when we started Zymochem, coming from a technical background and having some business acumen, we understood that this was actually a gap in the industry. You know, the Bay Area is a hotbed for innovation, has been a hotbed for innovation for so many years, you know, with the Silicon Valley being here. And in the early 2000s, we made many, many breakthroughs in this field of how you could use enzymes, engineered microbes to do very specific things, right? And so this to me was the innovation that got kickstarted. And what I like to think about this as, you know, we have a Silicon Valley since all of this is using carbon, this is also a carbon valley because of those innovations, right? But as you can imagine, the gap of taking this technology to bring it to everyone it was really around scale and to, to do it at a cost point that makes sense for the consumers. And that was really what I wanted to do. You know, obviously doing cool science and taking it to the next frontier is one thing, but then bringing that science into commercialization so that it impacts everyday life is, is something that I was very passionate about. So that's how we came up with the idea of Zymochem is to really bridge this gap from science to commercialization that we saw that existed, you know, back in 2014, 2015. And one of the first things was to, to bring on a co-founder, John, who's sort of my partner in crime and, and was crazy enough to see this vision and, and, and build a company with me. What would you say your long-term goals and vision are for Zymocam? The vision for Zymocam hasn't really changed in the 10 years. You know, when we started, there were three really key issues that we wanted to change. So one was how materials that we use today are made. Right? All of these materials are made from chemicals that get manufactured from fossil-based inputs. So think about coal, think about natural gas, think about oil. And so this is very really one-directional, right? We're taking stuff out of the ground and putting it in the atmosphere. That's the way it goes. And so we wanted to change that sourcing of how things are made. So that was the first problem that we wanted to solve, saying, how can we use more renewable sources of inputs to manufacture these same things? The second problem that we wanted to solve was the carbon intensity or the amount of energy you need during manufacturing. Now, all of these things require very high temperatures, very high pressures for manufacturing versus enzymes. They operate at room temperature. You know, think about fermentation, which uses microbes to brew beer. It's a very similar process just like that. It operates at room temperature in water. So it's very benign from an energy perspective. And what this means is that the carbon footprint, the amount of CO2 you emit during manufacturing is substantially lower with these types of technologies as well. So you're solving a second problem, which is how much CO2 is emitted during manufacturing. And the third one is, is one that sort of became a little personal as we you know, went through the journey of Zymochem, and which is one around the persistence of plastics in the environment much longer than they should. Right. And this is also a materials question, plastics and materials that get made from these chemicals. And so when we were thinking, saying like, hey, we're bringing a completely novel way of manufacturing. Can we use this novel way of manufacturing to redesign materials or polymers or plastics, right, which are all in that same bucket to actually be much more friendly for the planet in the environment? You know, don't persist for a thousand years when you're only used for a minute. Right. So these were the three key issues that we wanted to solve. One was how can we source these chemicals and materials 
from a different, more environmentally friendly way? How can we manufacture things with much less carbon footprint? And the third is really around end of life. How do you construct materials such that they have a much more planet friendly end of life? So for us, those were the three key goals that we wanted to address. And essentially, our goal is to hopefully have an environment where all the materials that we all love and use today are manufactured using renewable carbon. So think about carbon sources that we can grow, that we can use, having very low carbon footprint during manufacturing, and have better end of life, right? And so we're working on very large problems, touching multiple different industries from hygiene, which is think about diapers, adult incontinence, feminine hygiene on one end, to materials and polymers that go in textiles, the auto industry, et cetera. And so we're really bringing this tool set to these different industries. How did you identify and target these initial markets? And this is such a big dream and goal of yours. What strategies do you have to achieve them? Absolutely. That's a great question. Part of this and is also kind of, we didn't really want to work on smaller things, you know, because we had the opportunity, we had the training, we had the skill set, we had the ability to attack such a big problem. We actually chose to go after these things because we knew it would matter, right? And some of the things that you absolutely need as you're thinking about these large goals is like, hey, how do you achieve them, right? We're 10 years into this journey of Zymocam and we're still sort of what I would say is in the first or second innings of our journey. And one of the key aspects is to really have mission aligned, vision aligned partnerships and people, right? And there's a lot of folks at the table who want to bring products to market. Think about industry leading chemical companies. Those are one of our partners. Manufacturing companies who want to see real change. Very large brands who want to stand for something that they believe in from a sustainability perspective. And investors who realize that all of this can actually carry financial returns. And so we've been blessed that over the last 10 years, we've actually had the support from a village, so to say, to bring all of these technologies that we've been developing through the various journey points into where we are today. So in that sense, I'm quite lucky that we have had the people and the partnerships with this vision, with this support to enable this. So that's one portion. And then to the other portion, it's sort of how do you identify your initial market, right? And that's a, that's a tricky one because you could do a lot of things, but early on in Zymochem's life, for a number of different reasons, we chose to focus very specifically on just materials. So materials that go into everyday products. So think about plastics as an example, right? Think about polymers that go into making nylons that go into making your favorite jackets, your leggings. If you open up a car, every plastic under the car hood is, is, a, is a polymer. So we thought about that as a section of the chemicals industry that we wanted to focus and specialize in. And very specifically, the reason for doing that was also what we had seen over the past 10 years, and I'm sure you have seen it too, there's actually a lot of regulation throughout the world in many shapes and forms against single-use plastics, right? The impact, the pollution, the microplastics that come from single-use plastics and one of the fundamental bets that we took at Zymochem early in the day from a market perspective was, you know, plastic is a material. And so if regulation is going to drive change in how plastics are made and the end of life of plastics, it's going to percolate through consumers, brands, chemical companies, and the whole chain there to think about sustainability as a key driver for materials, right? Because these are all within the subsection of materials. And so that's the fundamental reason why we chose materials as a subsection to focus on within Simulcam. And then once we pick that, we then went down the list of, you know, again, what is really important to bring change, right? So one is really economics. And so one of the first filters that we've used at Zymocam to pick which of the various materials and chemicals that go into making these everyday goods do we want to work on, the primary filter we use, Anne, is economics. Hey, can I, under my dream scenario of manufacturing how I want to do this, 
do I have a leg to stand on versus, you know, the incumbent petrochemical industry, which has been there for, you know, a long, long, long time, right? Because one of the things that we have seen very effectively is if you have an advantage on cost, the whole industry will switch to your technology, right? And so that's a big driver for us when we think about these giant scales that we want to address, these big problems that we want to address. And so we put a lot of thought and effort into understanding our cost structure, understanding our existing materials cost structure and advantages, et cetera. And a part of that involves us interviewing the entire supply chain of our particular products, starting from existing manufacturers who manufacture this particular chemical, companies that take this chemical and then convert it into different products, and then brands that would take these products and then you know create something out of it for a consumer and then the end consumer itself, right? So I'll give you a specific example over here so that it's not abstract, right? One of the products that we're very excited about is, is making nylon, 6-6, which comes from adipic acid, which is one chemical, and hexamethylenediamine, which is another chemical. So these are two chemicals that combine to make nylon 6-6. And that nylon 6-6 then goes into making engineering plastics that go into automotives. It goes into making fiber that goes into textiles. And then it percolates into very different industries, right? And so think about your jackets that have the rainproof thing that's, you know, has some nylon in it, right? And so what we're really doing is engaging the whole supply chain, but really working with the you know, very front of the supply chain to slot in our product and process. And so as we think about like, hey, if I were to you know, create an alternative material, alternative bio-based nylon, one of the first things, as I mentioned, we do is we actually interview the whole supply chain to understand is there an adoption necessity, right? What does those adoption cycles look like? And is there a critical pain point we are solving for all the folks along the supply chain? And do we have a cost structure to stand on, right? And so that's sort of our second piece of large work that we do before we go into the technical side of things, right? Like, hey, let's start putting people, resources, et cetera, towards developing this technology. So it's really around business robustness of different products and how to understand and quantify that for us. And you had mentioned that there are some companies that are aligning with your mission and vision. Are you able to mention what some of these brands are? Yeah, absolutely. You might have seen our Series A announcement early in their year, where we raised a $21 million financing. As part of that financing, one of the brands that invested in us was Lululemon. You can look at their sustainability profile, and they're really looking towards sustainable materials to drive innovation in the products that they create. Another investor of ours was Toyota Ventures. And Toyota Ventures, one of their mandates is to really bring in decarbonize more sustainable materials to the wider industry. And so we've been privileged enough that we've had partners and investors like this supporting our mission, supporting our cause, supporting the type of products that we're making from a sustainability perspective. And there's more, but unfortunately, I can't really say we do feel very lucky that the, the world and Zymochem's mission is getting to the point where we're seeing a lot of the consumer-driven pull for technology and adoption of bio-based, decarbonized, more sustainable materials. It's nice to hear that companies like that are working with you. So for anyone that doesn't know or understand the science of what you're talking about, including myself, how does a biomanufactured chemical really differ from the existing options? So let me give you two examples over here. Biomanufacturing is essentially where you use biology to manufacture things, right? Now, when I say biology, it is basically what I'm trying to say over here is you do fermentation with a microbe that you have engineered to literally brew different chemicals. So it's the same process of making beer, but instead of making beer or ethanol, which is the, you know, the true carbon alcohol that we all love and enjoy, or most of us love and enjoy, right? Instead of doing that, you change the yeast or the different microbes so that you can make a different chemical, right? 
And so that's the biomanufacturing piece. And so what you could do is you could biomanufacture the exact same chemical that companies are using today, right? So you're not really changing the chemical identity of what's, what's being done. Or you can use this technology to manufacture something that is a very different molecule, right? That's a very different chemical. But that same chemical can still be used for an existing application. So A, it's biomanufacturing is different than chemical manufacturing. And B, the output of that biomanufacturing can be the same or it can be different, right? So I'll give you an example for each. The nylon that we talked about previously, where we're using the biomanufacturing to make a bio-based version of the nylon, it's chemically identical to what is used today, but it is sourced differently, right? So if you go back to the three problems that we want to solve, one is how do you source the materials differently? We're not using fossil-based inputs. We're using renewable sugars that go into this. And then when you're using biomanufacturing, the energy that you put into the system is quite low. So the carbon intensity, the carbon footprint of our nylon is substantially lower than a fossil-derived nylon, right? And so those are the two advantages that come when you make the exact same thing that you're using today, but with a different process, with a different input. On the other hand, because this is a new technology and we can make a lot of cool things that you know traditionally you cannot do with organic chemistry or is it's too expensive with organic chemistry, you can also create novel materials, novel things. And so here I want to give you an example of another product that is very close to commercialization and Simochem, and I'm personally very excited about too, is a super absorbent polymer. This is a polymer, as it says, super absorbent, can absorb a hundred or a few hundred times its weight in water, right? Like kind of becomes, it swells up a lot. And this is the stuff that is the backbone of the whole hygiene industry. So think about diapers, think about feminine pads, think about adult diapers, right? All of these industries utilize this magic powder in it that essentially holds the, the pee, the blood, the urine in these constructs. Now, this material was invented back in the 1900s, but it persists for 500 years, right? So it doesn't degrade. And so one of the things that, that we started to think at Zymochem is say, can we invent another polymer that does the same thing, which is like, hey, when you, when you add water or urine to it, it swells up and you know, it holds it in. But... It is derived from biology and can biodegrade, you know, and not persist for hundreds of years. And so that's the other side of biomanufacturing, right? So where you can get to invent new things, you can get to create new things that don't exist and bring, you know, materials that have properties that didn't exist before, but have a huge environmental benefit, right, for the consumer and for the planet. And I'll give you one statistic, which blew my mind about five years ago, which is, you know, diapers are the third largest item in landfill after food and paper, right? In the United States, it's the third largest item. And to me, when I think about a single use plastic, right? I mean, we've heard this word very times. We, we sort of roughly, truly equate this with, you know, disposable forks, spoons, or like plastic bags. But honestly, you can use all of those more than once. If you wash it, you can use it. You know what you can't use more than once? A diaper. <laughs> right? <laughs> to me, it's the, it's the quintessential single-use plastic, <laughs> right? And so we want to bring change to this massive industry, right, where, you know, these diapers don't persist for 500 years plus when they are really used for a few hours at best. This is an incredible cause to devote your life to. How did you go about approaching the initial research and development phase? And can you tell us about some of the scientific challenges that you've faced along the way? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this is where the lack of hair and uh, the gray hair comes in. <laughs> so, one of the advantages that we have being in the Bay Area as a, as a company is that we just have a phenomenal pool of talent over here. You know, we have some great universities over here, some really great minds over here. 
and so you know we're we're now a 55 percent company i believe 30 to 40 percent of the folks that work at zymochem have phd so that the technical understanding the technical knowledge coming from the best minds in the country is i think really critical for us to solve the technical challenges right as we look at you know inventing this new technologies and, and bring it to commercially and so the first question is, does it really work? And then we spend a lot of time and effort towards understanding whether we can make it to work. And usually that's not a not an issue. It's a time and a and a dollar issue, right? Like how much time do we have? How much focus do we have? And how much money do we have to spend towards, you know, developing this technology or chasing this particular innovation, right? Once you're sort of beyond that, that's where sort of the commercialization side of things becomes an important piece, which is like, does your stuff actually perform and can you scale, right? And so on the super absorbent polymer piece, I'll give you this one story. You know, there's like 4 million metric tons of this product, just this polymer, not the diapers made globally. And the whole hygiene industry where this powers it is like 155 billion. So this is like massive scales, right? And in 2020, we, we have created this new problem where, and we were at the top of the world. It was like, oh man, this works. We had this phenomenal breakthrough and we had this little, little small while of material with us. And so we were so proud of. And then we go in and take it to the industry and the, the industry says, you know, and they were really nice and they, they acknowledged what we had done, but we could see that they were like, okay, guys, this is really like a hobby, you know, show up with much larger materials and, and we'll talk. And, you know, obviously we're, we're traversing that journey but, you know, over the years, we've kind of went from this to creating hundreds of kilos of materials and now going to a lot larger scale. And so, you know, the ability to scale things up after passing the innovation and the technology development is a key aspect. And a lot of companies fail in this sort of what they call the valley of death, you know, bridging between technology and commercialization, right? So challenges keep changing as you're crossing certain aspects of your product development cycle towards commercialization. And each one is unique and it's, it has its own fun associated with it. So on the other side, can you tell us about some of the technological breakthroughs that have fueled your success? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll again kind of go back to my beer analogy over here. When you do fermentation, and maybe for some of your viewers who are home brewers, right? When you make beer at home, you will see a lot of frothing. You lose a lot of carbon in the form of CO2. You experience that, right? Now, that's good for a beer because, you know, you want a little bit of a head on your beer for sure. But when you think about manufacturing, right, that carbon that is lost as CO2 is a big cost penalty. And so the same process is, happens when you make chemicals. So you lose a lot of carbon, at least a third, if not more, of the carbon in the form of CO2. So what ends up happening is you only make a little bit of product and you lose some SEO too. So what we did at Zymochem when we started was like, hey, can we invent a series of chemistry reactions that are done by enzymes inside a microbe such that this carbon is not lost as CO2? And so the principle was really like, hey, I want to take all the carbon that you put in inside a microbe and make it my product and not lose a CO2. That was the basic principle. And so for that, we had to discover enzymes that could do this, put it inside a microbe and show the concept works, right? And essentially what to me is like, you know, if you brew, you get a six pack, right? For a particular price. With our technology as an example, you would get a nine pack, right? So you get 50% more product using the same inputs, the same infrastructure. So that's the kind of product scale, product quantity, economics impact our innovation has had on the type of chemicals, the type of materials we are making. There's a lot of successes that I can share, but one of the things that I promised my wife, right, as we had worked on the super absorbent polymers that go into making these better diapers, right, sustainable diapers. I promised her that before our kids get potty trained, I'll be able to create a, a version of the diaper with our material in it and, and put it on them, <laughs> right? And it was literally in the nick of time, you know, about a month before they, they finished their potty training, we had created diapers that I was able to put on them. And, you know, obviously, you know, it worked quite well. And so that to me, I still remember, like they were the first test subjects of our material in a finished consumer product. 
And it made me very, very happy. And I still remember fondly about like six years into the making, but finally I was able to do that. And I was quite happy about the outcome. My goodness, I just got chills when you were saying that. And your kids will know that you contributed to this in that way. So can you discuss a failure that you faced, something that really set you back and what you learned from it? Yeah, very much. So first I'll just say, you know, the nature of entrepreneurship, failure is a very everyday occurrence. And I'm sure all of you are quite aware with that too. (laughs) And over the years, as I've reflected on failure, for me, one of the things that it has done is it leads you to perseverance. And perseverance leads you to growth. You know, it makes you uncomfortable. It makes you do things that you're not very good or comfortable doing. And that's really when you expand and grow as an entrepreneur. And so to me, I actually look forward to failure because it it helps you. It helps you point in a direction which is really great for you in the long term. I love these quotes from the NVIDIA CEO. It's like, I I wish failure on all all entrepreneurs because that is the recipe for success. (laughs) But recognize that, work towards it. And, you know, once you come out of it, you would be in a much better position to take the journey to the next stage. And we've had tons of failures from we have a particular deadline that was very crucial for the next stage unlock in terms of funding. And we were not there. And, you know, we had to spend night and day to figure out what was wrong and then kind of, you know, convert that and then take lessons from what could we have done differently to make this happen. During COVID times, I mean, this was insanity. The whole bay was was shut down and we had a massive milestone that was due, right? I mean, we couldn't really do a whole lot about it, but, you know, you have to, you have to accept what was there and then move forward. There's always things that are both expected, unexpected that will come at you and it will lead you to new discoveries and new ways of finding your way around the problem. And in some instances, you can't find a way around the problem and you have to take it on the chin and learn from it and then adapt and grow. I imagine that all of this innovation, research and scientific breakthroughs are very costly to perform. So How did you secure funding for Zymochem in the beginning? It is expensive to do experiments, get a lab, et cetera. And here also what I would say is, you know, we were very conscious of who we were as a company and what sources of capital would that unlock for us, right? And we've been very consciously building that, that the stage of the company matches the appetite of the capital as well, right? And so in the early days of Zymochem, and we were literally in a, an idea on paper a little bit beyond that, the sources of capital for us were ones who really wanted our vision to succeed, right? And having an understanding that if our technology is developed, it could have a massive impact. And so we were lucky enough to be selected by the government. So we received an, you know, a few different grants, government grants, to really help us develop the early stages you know, of the company. And they were really looking at sustainability and domestic manufacturing as a key pillar for the United States. And so that made sense collectively. Additionally, we also were lucky enough to work with, you know, Indie Bio and Breakout Labs. So these were two incubators, grant foundations that, that would fund you early enough for your vision and for your potential for impact. Now, as PhDs coming out of academia fresh, <laughs> right, there's a lot of learning that needs to happen. So we were very, quite cognizant, like our strengths matched quite well with the stage and these resources that were available to us. And then over time, you know, as we developed the product where we could talk about the product, we could show physical samples, we could talk about customer traction, we could talk about purchase orders, we could talk about what we had de-risk. That started to unlock different stages of partnership, different stages of capital for us as well. You had mentioned the importance of scalability and commercialization in your industry, which makes a lot of sense. What would you say the critical steps are in taking a biotech product from the lab to the market? You really start with the end in mind, right? So at the end of the day, We are a biotech product, but it is a product that we have to sell. We are a company. And so the key aspect that comes to mind as you think about sort of starting with the end in mind is like, how robust is your business case, 
right? Because that's where things get expensive and that's where things fail. Like if your business case is not robust, right? It becomes difficult. Do folks want it? Are they willing to pay for it? Can you manufacture it at a cost that makes sense? Do I have a team that can execute on, on this vision, right? So that robustness is key. And so as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, I think establishing that is a big and important piece of the puzzle. And then keeping a track on the underlying value drivers for your business, right? And keeping a very sort of Hawkeye-ish stance on that and keeping an eye on it is, is an important piece. And then you sort of go more in the technical development and sort of, you know, lay a map on sort of like, hey, how much is going to cost me to fund this? And is there a business return that I can justify to my investors and sort of do sort of the more Excel-based analysis of like, it's going to take me four years, five years, this much dollars to get to over here, then I had this much capital to unlock this much return, and that's how much I would be worth, my company would be worth. And then it's the hard part. Everything looks good. You actually go ahead and do it. So I would actually flip the order, as I suggested, and really start with the end in mind. Because if you can't really make a money on the product or the consumers don't want it effectively, you don't have a business. And so that's, to me, sort of the, the way to think about it. Do you feel that you are on the path to being able to manufacture these items that you were hoping to at a cost that will make sense for consumers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so great to hear. How do you balance your focus between innovation and commercialization? That's a constant act. Now, fortunately for us, the challenges that you face, especially when you look at commercialization, are quite different than the ones facing the innovation side, especially as we talk about the product life cycle between innovation and commercialization. They're, they're quite stark. So you can have dedicated team, dedicated expertise focused on commercialization versus innovation, right? And so I think that helps from a planning, logistics, and execution perspective to solve that and for me as a CEO, and I think for a lot of the folks, it's actually fun to, to be able to look at both the sides, right? Because both the sides have their own unique set of challenges. They exercise different muscles in your mind. You know, innovation is more blue sky. Commercialization is very driven by value and timelines. And so it, it brings out very different traits in you. And I think it's actually a really good thing to have both pillars within the company. Because you are a B2B business, what can we as consumers do to support what it is that you are working on? You know, whenever there is an option for you to buy something that is more sustainable, please, you know, try to do that. As a father of two kids, you know, I'm a consumer myself too, right? I mean, ultimately, all of these technologies, you know, are for the next, you know, future generations, right? We want to leave the planet in a way that is in a better shape for them than hopefully we all found it, right? And so the consumer voice is probably the most important ones because that's the way you drive innovations through the funnel. The other piece is regulation. You know, obviously we all have a voice here. And if there are regulations where you can vote on, we can have influence on, that's another piece that also drives a lot of new technologies, a lot of innovation. It's always a good reminder to hear. So just as a closing question here, if you could go back and talk with yourself when you were in your early 20s, what insight would you give yourself? So I have two, two things to say here. One's a little bit personal to me. And, and I would, what, what I would say, go back to my 20s, is to think about legacy a bit more. What I really mean by legacy is, you know, when I started to do my PhD and sort of craft my own path away from the family business, Obviously, there's nobody else to take the baton and take it forward. And what, what I didn't really appreciate about that choice, right, was really, you know, it's a lot of effort to create a business from the ground and then actually pass on a successful business over generations, right? That legacy is something that, and I guess now, more so than before, I've realized is something that is really great. You know, I look at these multinational corporations, you know, Japanese corporations, they, are, you know, they have a conglomerates there. They've been around for 150, 200 years. The culture, the tradition, the, the baton that you pass on in terms of values is phenomenal. That's something that I didn't truly understand <laughs> when I was in my 20s. So that one advice I would give myself is to think about that. 
The other one, which is more genetic for everyone, including myself, is it's very hard when you are in, in your 20s to, to think about and to really strive to understand what you want to do, right? What journey you want to be on and why, right? I mean, to me, spending time thinking through that can be very, very rewarding, right? To me, that's a, that's a big piece. If you think about it and figure out what that means to you, and if you have the freedom or the support from your family, from your friends, et cetera, to be on this journey, to be able to dedicate a large portion of your life to something you really want is quite rare, right? It, not everybody gets to do it. Not everybody has the environment to do that. And that's truly a privilege if you do get to do that. And then if you actually find meaning, if you find success, if you find happiness as you're sort of going through this journey, is truly a blessing. And so think about this process and start as soon as possible, because if you actually are able to pull it off, it could be quite phenomenal. That is some great advice. Herschel, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with all of us. Thank you for having me here, Anne. It's been an honor to share the story with you and the listeners who are here and look forward to reconnecting soon as we are able to announce more stuff. As always, thanks for being here. Today's key takeaways. To bring fundamental change to a large industry, new technologies must be able to scale significantly and meet consumers at existing price points. So build backwards and make sure you can achieve both of these if you want to tackle a big problem. Find mission-aligned and vision-aligned partnerships with people, businesses, and investors who realize that doing good can actually be profitable. If you're trying to identify a business opportunity, consider interviewing other businesses or people in an industry you are interested in and see if there is a critical pain point you can solve to unlock opportunities. Many companies fail at bridging the gap between technology and commercialization. So if you're planning to enter this space, focus on this critical transition. View challenges and hurdles as opportunities to innovate and solve problems. Failure is a regular part of entrepreneurship that leads to perseverance, growth, and expansion. Accept challenges and failures, learn from them, adapt, and move forward. Consider your legacy. The culture traditions, and values you plan to leave behind. And lastly, take time to reflect on your journey. Find meaning, success, and happiness in what you do. That's it for today. I release episodes once a week, so come back and check it out. Have a great day.